Good day ladies and gents. We're going to be looking at the design of steel structures in fire now. If you've covered a or done a steel design course undergraduate, what we're going to be looking through now should be relatively straightforward. But since fire design is inherently very multidisciplinary, we have uh, people from other professions, whether it be mechanical engineering, electrical and outside, being exposed to fire design. We're going to cover some of the basic principles as well in this lecture. You also should refer to one of the other videos covering the section factor calculation for um, steel elements. We're not going to look at that now, but there is a detailed vi video looking at section factors for steel elements. But we're going to start out just having a look at a steel beam with a load on it, um, and this is spanning between two supports each side, and then, so it's supported there and supported there, so isometric view, simply supported steel beam carrying a distributed load on top of it. Now as it's loaded, the top flange, so if we use this as our cross section through it, the top flange will go into compression, the bottom flange will go into tension, and as the load increases, it'll get to a stage where it wants to buckle, that it'll want to kick sideways and undergo lateral torsional buckling. So if I draw a diagram of what lateral torsional buckling looks like, it's basically that, where eventually this beam is, becomes unstable and then buckles sideways and then twists. So it's both a lateral movement and a torsional movement, a twist. And when it comes to design, both for ambient and fire temperature, we need to look at between where and where will it buckle. For instance, we often have beams connected into the side of this. So if this was spanning 10 meters, we might have another secondary beam coming in at 5 meters into the side of it. And that would provide some sort of lateral support and prevent buckling. So when we look at the buckling behavior, at the time it buckles, if you were to look at it, it would probably do something like that. That the top flange, which we can consider as a column, would actually buckle sideways. And it could go either way, but you would see this movement. So what I've drawn is the top flange there, which has now failed. And it can't move sideways where there's a lateral support, so there's a beam or a column or something preventing sideways movement. And when we are now designing it, this length there, that is now our effective length, or our L value. And so we will have two values on this, L1 and L2. And those would be the buckling lengths we would design. We work out the force in and then design it independently. This effective length is influenced by the boundary condition. So what is fixed to it here? And does this prevent rotation at this position? So we can potentially modify it by an effective length factor K. But at fire condition behavior, a connection behavior is very complex in fire behavior. So in general, probably safer keeping this at one, um, so a simply supported, so it's free to rotate, unless you do have uh, good information. It is also influenced by stabilizing and destabilizing loads, uh, which you'll refer to your own local code. We're not going to discuss that now, but just to be aware, you're designing between points of lateral support, so those become the L values that go in your, your bending design calculations. Similar sort of uh, thing when we consider the uh, a column. If this is heated in fire, it's got a fire all around, it is heated up, and as it heats up, the capacity is reduced. We need to know what our fire limit state load is here. So some load being applied to it at the fire limit state. And to make sure that's strong enough, we first work out the temperature of the column, and then we work out the buckling um, capacity. So if this is a cross section through the column, uh, this is my x-axis. In the Eurocode, this is referred to as the y-axis, and then or the y-axis, which and once again in the Eurocode is referred to as z. So it depends on which country in South Africa we use x and y, but Eurocode and others use y and z. And uh, we'd have to look at when it buckles, if it's buckling about the y-axis, it would mean it would go sideways like that. So if I was looking at my column, it would want to buckle out sideways. So if I had a floor, for instance, this is a two-story building, this is four meters and another four meters, my L value would be influenced by between where and where do I have lateral support. And once again, we could have two L values, L1 and L2, and we would check each 
each of these with the load coming down to just to make sure it is strong enough. And we would use the reduced um, capacity of the, fire, um, of the material in fire. So if this column was at 600 degrees Celsius, we'd use uh, the 600 degree Celsius yield strength and Young's modulus in our calculation for the capacity of this column. Same thing for this beam. Calculate the capacity using heat transfer and you can refer to a detailed work example um, in the videos provided of calculating uh, temperatures. And uh, from that, if this is 600 degrees Celsius, we would use the yield strength and Young's modulus at 600 degrees Celsius. So that's a, a simple overview, as I said, mainly undergraduate uh, topics being covered, but just give an overview of steel design at high temperature, how we go about it. Create a fire, calculate temperature, get our loads at the fire limb state, apply the loads, get the force, and then when it comes to design, look between where and where do we have our points of support, use those effective lengths, and then apply those effective lengths in our moment resistance calculations, in our compression resistance calculations, and ultimately see, is my resistance greater than my force? If it is, great. If not, either provide more passive protection to drop the temperature or use a bigger beam. So that covers the basics of steel design and fire. Thank you.